I'm reaching for it now. Let's try this. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and start now. Okay, everybody should see the slide that says active membrane transport, I hope. And um, we're going to pick up here. Now, this is not something, this is not real exciting information. So just bear with me on this. We'll get through it. We know that cells are love free. Cells love to have, um, don't, cells love to, to not have to spend energy. We don't like to spend money to do things. Uh, cells don't like to spend energy to do things. And, Uh, but there are times when a cell will have to expend energy to get things done. 
and that includes moving things across its uh, membrane. And so we have active transport and vesicular transport. Uh, active transport is exactly like it sounds. We require energy to move things across a membrane. Now, a vesicular transport is when we use a bubble called a vesicle to bring stuff into the cell or out of the cell. Now, the reason we do this, the reason there is active transport is perhaps what we want to get is too large. Perhaps it's a cell fragment. Perhaps the cell is trying to dissolve a cell fragment or a bacteria <coughs> or a virus, uh, or it's trying to eat the cell next door. They do that, you know, um, if, they don't, if, the, if the cell next door steps out of line, meaning it starts acting erratically, then all of its friends and neighbors will gang up on it and eat it gets, and get rid of it. So, um, it's a very tough homeowners association, if you will, when you consider that. Now, sometimes things are too big. Sometimes they're not soluble in fat. And sometimes you want to move something against its concentration gradient. For example, sodium, good old sodium. We have lots of sodium. <clears throat> there is a, an abundance, an overabundance of sodium outside our cells. And sodium being what it is, will leak into the cell. Now, we don't want that. Our cells don't need sodium. So what they will do is that you know, the cells will leak into the, the, the sodium will leak into the cells passively. And the cell will actually, will have to actively pump it out to get rid of the excess sodium. And this will make a whole lot more sense further along we go in the semester. Because you see, the ability to contract a muscle cell depends on the movement of sodium and potassium on the membrane of the cell. Our cells are electrically charged. They're positive on the outside, negative on the inside. They're positive because there's a whole lot of sodium outside the cell, and that makes the outside of the cell positive. There's a lot of potassium on the inside of the cell, and that makes the inside of the cell negative. If the positive sodium leaks into the cell, the cell no longer stays positive outside and negative inside. See, it's like a battery. Battery has a positive and negative end. When uh, that no longer exists, the battery's dead. Well, if the cell lets a lot of sodium come into it, it's no longer gonna have a positive side and a negative side it can no longer contract as a muscle or send a nerve impulse or anything like that. And it's essentially dead. And so what we do is we try to keep the high concentration of sodium outside the cell. So if sodium leaks in, we pump it out. Now, the problem with pumping it out is that we have to move against the concentration gradient. There's always a lot of high sodium outside. Some sodium will leak into the cell and you're going to be pumping it back out. So you're essentially pumping it uphill. You know, we, we, we're, it's like pumping water up a hill. It's exactly what it is or what it's like, because you're going to go against the, the, the concentration gradient. You know, the flow of, of sodium, there's a massive amount of sodium trying to get into a cell and you're trying to pump it back out. It's like going the wrong way you know, you're at Walmart, you got your buggy, you turn down an aisle, and all of a sudden the whole world's coming towards you and you're trying to go down the other aisle. We've all been there, right? You're trying to go against all this flow coming the other way for some reason, they're all coming where you're standing and you're trying to go the other way. That's what this, you know, and you, it requires more energy to, to knock those other buggies out of the way. I mean, to, to work your way through the, the, the other people, right? You don't really knock them down, do you? My wife would, she's very aggressive. You get her behind a buggy and she gets real aggressive. So anyway, so we have mechanisms to move things against a concentration gradient. They all require energy. They're all called active transport. We have carrier proteins that do the job for us. Some are called anti-porters. They, um, they work by bringing 
uh, they'll take they'll kick one substance out of a cell against its concentration gradient and bring another one back in against also against its gradient. See, because I mentioned that there's lots of sodium outside the cell always leaking in. Well, there's lots of potassium in the cell always leaking out. We don't want that to happen either. We want to keep sodium on the on the outside, potassium on the inside. So at the same time, we're pumping out sodium, we're pumping in potassium. We got to go against the concentration there because there's high so high potassium inside. We're pumping uphill with the potassium. And that takes a lot of energy to do that. Sometimes we have what are called symporters. We can pump two different things the same way. That's a little easier. You're, you're not working against two different concentration gradients, but you still use up energy. And cells will use about 40% of their available energy just to pump the concentrations back and forth. Because it's so important that we maintain a positive charge on the outside of a cell and a negative charge on the inside. And the way we do that is control the concentration of sodium and potassium. Primary active transport is what we do. We pump something across the membrane. We pump it against its concentration gradient. Primary active transport requires ATP. We have a whole boatload of pumps, little microscopic cellular pumps embedded in our cell membranes that actually will pump substances across the membrane one way or another. And they're, in, they're embedded there. They are, they are carrier proteins that can change their shape when exposed to ATP. The only way they change their shape is by using energy. And we get the energy from the ATP. We have a variety of, of pumps. We have pumps for calcium. We have pumps for hydrogen. We call those proton pumps. Proton pumps uh, were all very much, if you have acid reflux, or if we say gastroesophageal reflux disease, uh, and you take um, a, um, a meprazole or uh, Nexium or uh, Pepsi or anybody that has reflux disease takes this medication, what they do are shut down the proton pumps in our stomach. Protons, remember protons, hydrogen ions are what makes things acidic. Our, our stomach is always pumping out hydrogen ions as it makes hydrochloric acid. And so to treat your patient that has acid reflux, we give them a, a medication that shuts down those pumps like pomotidine or any of the other you know, different medications that I mentioned earlier, what they do is they shut down those pumps because you're pumping hydrogen ions you know, into the stomach from these little proton pumps. And the one that we all, that is the most well-known is what's known as the sodium potassium pump. Sodium potassium pump, is so important to us because it regulates the sodium concentration outside the cell and the potassium concentration inside the cell. And this sounds to totally boring, except this is the driver for all of our muscle contractions. If we didn't have a sodium potassium pump, we couldn't contract our skeletal muscles. We have no control over our skeletal muscles. We have no control over our nerves because all of our skeletal muscle cells have high sodium outside and, and high potassium inside, but it's always leaking. Sodium is always leaking in and potassium is always leaking out. And if they were to ever reach equilibrium, the cell would be dead. So we'd have no muscle contraction and no nerve impulse. We are always trying to keep that from happening. And that's what the sodium potassium pump does. Pumps sodium out and potassium in to keep the high concentrations, one on the outside, one on the inside. So, so active transport. Active transport is in response to leakage of these ions into and out of the cell. Sodium leaks in, that's just what it does. It finds a way to get into a cell. It's a, sodium leaks in passively. We got to spend energy to get rid of it. You know, it's like, it's like your basement floods. 
what do you do? You pump out your basement. You have to pump the water out of your basement. Well, if you pump the water out of your basement, it's going to go out into the ground around your house. And guess what it's going to do? It's going to leak back in next time it rains. It does that over and over again. Sodium's like that. Sodium's always leaking into our cells. And we're busy pumping it out all the time. Same thing applies to potassium. We got lots of potassium inside our cells. It's leaking out because that's what it does. You know, whenever you have a high concentration of something, it wants to try and reach equilibrium. So, so potassium is going to leak out of the cell. The same pump that we use to pump sodium in, um, to pump sodium out, can be used to pump potassium in. That's why they call it the sodium potassium pump. It looks something like this. It's a, it's a transport, uh, it's a carrier protein embedded in the cell membrane. And it's designed only for sodium and potassium. Now the sodium potassium pump will pick up three sodiums out of the cytoplasm of the cell. And when it, and it'll hold it, like see in, in the first, first structure there, here's our plasma membrane, there is our, there's our pump with three sodium ions inside of it. Hasn't done anything yet, but then we managed to bring along an ATP molecule to that pump that activates the pump. The pump opens up and the sodiums leak. In doing so, they allow two potassiums to come in. And then when the potassiums come in, the, um, the gate at the bottom opens up and the potassiums drop in, drop into the side of the plasma. There's a gate. See, these, these, um, these uh, carrier proteins have a gate at each end. And the gate is, uh, is controlled by energy, the energy from the ATP. It's like, a, it's like an electrical gate, if you will. Um, and when we bring, or a chemical gate, when we bring the ATP up to the gate, it causes the gate to open to the outside. And the gates are, the sodium potassium gate will fill up with its sodiums. It always holds three sodiums. And then we bring ATP along, the gate opens up, the sodiums leave. And as soon as they do, then two potassiums can come in. And when the potassiums come in, the top gate closes and the bottom gate opens. And then we're ready to go again. We do this over and over and over again because we have to keep the charges separate. We have to keep the charge on a muscle cell of minus 90 millivolts. And the only way we do that is to make sure we keep lots of sodium outside the muscle cell and lots of potassium inside. A nerve cell is at minus 70 millivolts a little bit less than the muscle cell. But again, it depends on keeping the potassiums inside the cell and the sodiums outside. So, and it, you know, here's a nice little animation of it. We know more about the sodium potassium pumps than any other uh, membrane pump uh, in our bodies because it's so important to us because we've got to have that concentration difference there. So the pump, is always sending sodiums out. There are three sodiums, the gate opens, it looks like a Pac-Man. Uh, so three sodiums go out and two potassiums always come back in. It's always three sodiums out and two potassiums back in. You might wanna make a note of that somewhere. It's always three sodiums out and two potassiums back in. And they're both going against their concentration gradient because you're pumping sodium out to the outside where there's lots more sodium. You know, it's not going to go passively because it would be, it's going against its concentration. Uh, potassium going in is going, against, going from a lower concentration of potassium outside to a higher concentration inside, also against its concentration gradient. So we use this energy to do this over and over and over again. When we run out of energy, we reach equilibrium. And then the cell's dead. Because we don't want the cell to reach equilibrium. OK, so this is this, what we have here on the left is primary active transport, where we're spending the energy to pump sodiums back out. 
we pump sodiums back out and uh, we pump potassiums back in. Now, secondary active transport is a free ride. Just like if you pump water out of your basement it, and it goes back into your yard and into the soil and leaks back into the house, you know, you spent energy to pump it out, but it will come back in passively. Sodium, secondary active transport, as long as you're adding to the sodiums on the outside, they're going to keep leaking into the cell. But what they do for us in secondary active transport is that when they leak back in, many times they're going to piggyback along with glucose. So when sodiums are leaking back in through secondary active transport, when, they're, when the sodium is diffusing into the cell, it often goes through a carrier protein that's a free ride that allows glucose to come in at the same time. And so we see, we call this a symport, where we see sodium dragging along glucose. So that, that's one advantage of this. So you know, while we're paying the price by using ATP, we are finding a way to get glucose into the cell. Now, here's something we can actually see. This is using vesicles. Vesicles are nothing but bubbles. They're bubbles uh, with a cell membrane uh, structure, the same type of membrane structure that the, that the cell has is what makes up these vesicles. And we use these vesicles to get stuff into the cell or out of the cell. And you can see, for example, uh, at the, at the image and the, the animate the, the not animation, the video on the top, we are, uh, you're seeing um, a, a vesicle forming around something, some food, piece of food, uh, a cell fragment, a bacteria, but it's engulfing it. You see how it, whatever the substance is, is ending up inside a digestive vesicle. We want to get rid of it, and that's how we do it. A vesicle is nothing but a bubble. And we have three types of vesicles. We have ones that uh, allow us to undergo endocytosis, where we can bring things into the cell. We can engulf something inside, you know, uh, outside the cell and bring it in. We have exocytosis, where we have something we've made in the cell that we want to release to the outside. Maybe it's a waste product. Maybe it's a protein. Maybe it's uh, a, digestive, a digestive enzyme that we want to, maybe it's a hormone that we want to release to the, out, out of the outside of the cell. So we bring a vesicle, a bubble to the cell membrane, like we're doing in the bottom there. It fuses with the cell membrane and we release the contents out of here. So exocytosis then gets things out of the cell. Think exit for exocytosis and entrance for endocytosis. We bring things into the cell and we can do it with solid food, you know, food particles or a fragment of another cell, uh, a bacteria or any number of things like that. Pinocytosis is fluids that we wanna bring into the cell and receptor mediated endocytosis is a nice way of saying we're real picky about what we want to bring in. So we're only going to let certain things land on receptor sites and then we can engulf it. So this is endocytosis. We have something out in the cytoplasm or outside the cell that we want to bring in. So we simply raise the edges of the cell membrane around it trap it in a bubble and then the bubble called the vesicle or the vacuole pinches off and moves into the cytoplasm and then we can eat it we digest it that's what's called phagocytosis so you know whatever it is whatever we want to get rid of you know white blood cells do this all the time to get rid of bacteria uh you know the, the white blood cells the natural killer cells They'll take, they'll go after bacteria, they'll go after viruses, they'll go after cells that have worn out that need to be replaced, and they will engulf them and take them inside where they, inside their, their own cell structure where they can digest it then. Now in pinocytosis, it is 
we take in small particles inside a fluid, it will form a, a bubble of uh, liquid around the uh, substance. Uh, it's, maybe it's a very small particle, but again, it's the same principle. The cell membrane engulfs it, traps it, and brings it in. In this receptor mediated on the right, we have special receptors on a location on the cell membrane. So when something lands there, we can that that fits that receptor, we will then engulf it and bring it in in its vesicle. Exocytosis is the opposite. It's you know it's it's like endo it's endocytosis in reverse. We have something in a vesicle that we've made. Perhaps it's a protein. Perhaps it's a hormone. Perhaps it's a digestive enzyme, uh, and we're going to release it. And so we have we form it in a stored in a bubble, and we bring it to the surface of the cell membrane, and we fuse with the cell membrane and open up the, the bubble and release the contents. And on the right hand side, you see an image there of a vesicle magnified 100,000 times, releasing something to the outside of the cell. So this way we can deliver all the contents at one location at one time. Okay, so that is how we get stuff across the membrane. Now let's try to move on to a little more exciting topics. So now the cytoplasm is that stuff in, that, uh, that fits inside the cell membrane. It is a liquid, uh, a very goopy, that's a good technical term for it, goopy uh, liquid, uh, maybe the consistency of corn syrup, you know, uh, hot cake syrup, something like that. Uh, it, um, they describe it as uh, a gel, gel-like. It's not quite as thick as a gel. Sometimes we call it cytosol. Sometimes, uh, the old term for it was protoplasm. I've seen definitions that call it cell sac. Yeah, so it's sort of juicy in here, but it holds all the organelles. So it also holds, it holds the organelles. It holds uh, glycogen. It holds fats. It holds salts uh, suspended in here and it holds all the organelles itself, what we call the mitochondria, the nucleus, the uh, lysosomes, uh, a variety of organelles that make the cell work. Now, most of our organelles are gonna have a membrane around them just like the cell does. There are gonna be three types that don't, and I'll go through these so you can uh, get a better idea. So the first thing we see is the mitochondria. Mitochondria is one of the most important organelles inside the cell. This is where we get our energy released from. The, um, they are, you know, many biology books will refer to this as the power plant of the cell. They're more like an energy conversion site. They, uh, mitochondria take, take the energy from glucose and convert it into, and put it into ATP. That's what they do. You know, um, they are, if anything, they are energy conversion centers. So because the energy is available, the energy is in glucose, but we can't use it straight out of the glucose molecule because it would come out all at once. So we have to uh, release the energy slowly. So that, and then stick it into an AP, stick it, keep sticking the energy onto an ATP molecule so we can go do things. So we can't release all the energy at one time. That would not be a good thing. So we release it slowly. We make ATP molecules. Each ATP can carry somewhere in the neighborhood of about 7.2 kilocalories of energy. It only lasts for about five seconds. And then we have to make another one and another one and another one. So we have you know, cells that are gonna be very active are gonna have lots of mitochondria. Muscle cells have lots of mitochondria. Cells that are, are, not, are not as active will have fewer mitochondria. But they have a very characteristic shape. They look like little sausages. Bless you. Now another organelle. Now, oh, by the way, the mitochondria have a double membrane 
just like the cell does. Now, ribosomes don't have a, mem a membrane around there. Ribosomes really uh, form so that we can make proteins. Ribosomes are made up of ribosomal RNA, that nucleic acid we mentioned uh, at the end of chapter two. Uh, ribosomes are where we make our proteins. Instructions come out from the, from the nucleus and are sent to the um, ribosome and we make proteins at the ribosomes. We don't, because of its unique shape and structure, we don't need to have a membrane around it. Now, another structure that we see is called the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum is a series of tubes that completely surrounds the nucleus. And it looks like it's a bowl right here. The nucleus looks like a bowl and you have these, uh, the, the, the endoplasmic reticulum in red surrounding it. Well, it completely covers the nucleus. It surrounds it all the way around and embedded in the surface of most of the endoplasmic reticulum are the ribosomes I mentioned earlier. Because the ribosomes make their protein inside the rough endoplasmic reticulum. We call it rough because it's studded with ribosomes. All those little purple dots are ribosomes embedded in the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum. The other type of ER that you see, we have the rough ER we also have the smooth ER. It doesn't have any ribosomes present. So the rough ER is where we make proteins. We make all of our proteins there. We make phospholipids there to replace the cell membrane. It's constantly at work. Every protein in our body is assembled at the rough ER on the ribosomes. But the smooth ER does a lot of work too. It, bless you. It's a series of tubes, just like the rough ER is, but it does something different. It, um, it breaks down uh, fats. It uh, makes our steroid-based hormones. It, makes, it assembles cholesterol. It makes the high density and the low density lipoproteins. It also uh, trans it helps to transport fats. One of the big things it does for us, it is a detoxifier. It breaks down chemicals in our food. Remember everything we eat and everything we drink ends up in our blood and then it's distributed to the cells. The cells, you know, the liver has to get it first. Everything we eat and drink before it goes into our blood goes through our liver. Our liver is full of smooth cells with smooth ER because it has to break down all the chemicals in our food. All of the chemical additives, the flavoring agents, the uh, coloring agents, this, the artificial sweeteners, uh, the, you know, the carbonic acid, the phosphoric acid, it shows up in, in our uh, Cokes, in our diet drinks uh, are all in there. Uh, the, the food dyes that make food look appealing, you know, uh, that even, even the innocuous food dyes on M&Ms and stuff like that or on Skittles, all that has to get broken down. What about medications? You know, Tylenol. We take Tylenol when we have uh, pain. You know, Tylenol is um, a painkiller or pain blocker. That's all it does. You ever wonder how Tylenol knows to work uh, when you have a headache? You know, why, is it, why does it work in your head? It doesn't. It just goes where pain cell pain receptors are being activated, so it can go throughout your body. You know, it, it only will only it'll work there, just like um, Advil, Advil or at or even aspirin. These are these are anti-inflammatories. You know, so you you know you you have you have hurt your back or you have a patient that has hurt their knee and it's inflamed, and so they uh, they're given uh, Advil or aspirin. You know, aspirin still works too. They're both anti-inflammatories. They don't know where to work. They just go to work wherever there's inflammation. And so they start uh, reducing the, the infl inflammation, reducing pain, reducing, you know, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the 
the redness, reducing the, the heat coming off here. But before they get to go to work, they have to go through the liver. And the liver is going to break down those medications to a lower level. You know, I mean, on, on every medication you, you take, you know, and over at the counter, there's always some statement there that says, um, you know, adult dose, you know, two 500 milligram uh, Tylenol uh, tablets, right? You know, it's, it's like a thousand milligrams of Tylenol is the adult dose, two 500 uh, milligram tablets. A child's dose is like, you know, a, a fourth of that. Well, how come? How come a, a child doesn't get, you know, if Tylenol's going to do a good job for us, how come we don't give it to, to our kids if they don't dose? Well, maybe you do. Maybe you don't like the, like the kids, so you give them the adult dose. They're real quiet for a long time. Um, no, a child's liver can't process a thousand milligrams of Tylenol. So, uh, plus their body is smaller, so we give them a smaller dose. We give them what because their liver still has to process the Tylenol and destroy part of the Tylenol, and whatever comes out of their liver is what we get to use. You know, when we take a thousand milligrams of Tylenol, we don't get to keep all that. The liver breaks down some of it. And then the rest of it that gets through the liver is going to work on our bodies. So, the adult dose of any medication is calculated based on how much it's going to get through the liver. Yeah. If we take too much of a medication, the liver will detoxify as much as it can and it will still go through. You know, uh, people will. Uh, overdose on Tylenol because if you take too much, you know, you, you know, you take, you know, it, it's very, very specific that your the maximum adult dose every four to six hours is a thousand milligrams. Uh, if some is good, more is definitely not better with that. And people have people have committed suicide by overdosing on Tylenol. Yeah, you know, that's sort of the that's the hard way of doing it. It'll work, but it takes a lot of time to do that, but it will still work. Um, so what about other medications and drugs? What about alcohol? If an individual consumes alcohol, where does it go? Hmm? Straight to the liver. Thank you. It goes straight to the liver. Now, how much alcohol can you drink at one time and have no ill effects? It does depend, very much so. See, the liver can handle about one ounce an hour of alcohol. That is the amount that's in one bottle of beer, one mixed drink, or one glass of wine, unless you have a big glass of wine or whatever. You know, typical, typical, you know, if you go to a bar and order uh, or a restaurant, you get a bottle of beer or a glass of wine or, or a mixed drink, you're going to get one ounce of alcohol in there. And if you drink that, if you make that last oh, for an hour, then you can keep doing that all evening or all day and have no ill effects whatsoever because your, your liver will be keeping up with you. Well, most people don't. Most people don't wait that long between their drinks. I'll just put it that way. You know, it, uh, you know, Making a making one bottle of beer last for a whole hour is, is, is sort of disappointing. But what happens if you take two bottles of beer or two glasses? Now you have two ounces of alcohol. Your liver can't keep up. Your liver will be busy detoxifying the alcohol and ultimately producing carbon dioxide and water, but it will be doing it. You know, it, it will be overwhelmed because you'll have more alcohol than it can process. It will eventually process all of it, but not immediately. And what happens in, if an individual drinks, too, bless you, if an individual consumes too much alcohol in too short a period of time, then we get some consequences. You know, uh, three, three bottles of beer in an hour is probably going to alter your balance a little bit and, and your, your your, your common sense a little bit, but it, and it will also make you pee a lot too, because that's what alcohol does. Um, alcohol inhibits the hormone that, that controls when we pee. 
And so if you drink a lot of alcohol in a short period of time, you're going to have to pee a lot. So um, the, uh, if you drink a lot of alcohol at a rate faster than one ounce an hour, I'm just talking from the chemical perspective. If you drink a lot of alcohol faster than an ounce an hour, the uh, least offensive side effect you're going to have is a hangover the next day. The hangover that we refer to is simply the smooth ER not being able to keep up with the amount of alcohol. See, as we break the alcohol down into its, we break alcohol down into a bunch of metabolic byproducts. And some of those byproducts are very dangerous chemicals like formaldehyde. Now, normally what happens is we process uh, alcohol, we break it to formaldehyde and then we break it down to something else instantly. So we don't really feel the effects. But if you've had a lot to drink, if your patients had a lot to drink, um, then and their, their liver is not keep their liver won't keep up. Their liver will is unable to keep keep up with the amount of alcohol coming in. It will eventually clear it all away. But it's the side effects, the leftover chemicals that are still in our body uh, over a long period of time, is what produces the the ill feelings uh, the next day or even later in that day, you know, and so you wake up, you fall asleep. Usually what happens is your patient will fall asleep and then wake up and just feel terrible because it, uh, it is all the residual uh, chemicals still being processed through their system. So, uh, and then eventually uh, they feel better. One of the other side effects is your patient that has a lot of alcohol is dehydrated because they're going to pee a lot. They're not going to have any control over the need to urinate because the chemical that protect, prevents that from happening it is inhibited by alcohol. So the more alcohol you drink, the more alcohol your patient drinks, the more they're going to have to pee. And, you know, uh, and this will continue until their, their fluid levels get regulated again. So we, uh, we, our, our smooth endoplasmic reticulum does an awful lot of work for us that we don't even consider. When we think about all the things that processes to try and keep us in homeostasis. Another thing we, our smooth ER does is convert glycogen to glucose. So cells that have a lot of glycogen stored, like the liver, but also uh, the skeletal muscles are gonna have a lot of cells of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum to break glycogen down to glucose for energy. And another thing we see, particularly in our muscle cells, is we use calcium to trigger muscle contractions in our legs and our arms and our skeletal muscles. Um, and we wrap the, uh, our cells, our skeletal muscle cells are wrapped. Our, our skeletal muscle cells are wrapped by smooth endoplasmic reticulum that is packed full of calcium ions. And when we're ready to, to have a contraction, we will release those ions into our, into our muscles and they will bind on the certain proteins and allow the muscle to contract. So, and uh, oh, I got a comment here, let me. Yes, yes, it will, you know, the more alcohol a person takes in will eventually damage the liver. It will cause, uh, will usually ultimately cause what we call cirrhosis of the liver. Um, you know, it, it um, we find there are more and more studies coming along saying there is no, that actually come out and say there is no safe limit on alcohol consumption. So it, uh, you know, you pick your poison. Uh, a toxicologist will tell you that everything is a poison whether it is um, water, because water can kill you too, uh, or Coke or coffee or alcohol or sugar or any, any other medications. It's always the uh, toxicologist will tell you that the dose, uh, the dose will uh, make the poison. Okay, what causes non-alcoholic cirrhosis? Well, I will say that's a good question because I don't know the answer. That one I'll have to look up. So um, 
And I'm not going to try and dance around that. I just don't know. So, okay, so there's a long rabbit hole on smooth ER, but it does play such a big role for us in here. Now let's go on. Okay, another structure looks more like tubes also. It's called the Golgi apparatus. When we are busy making proteins in the ribosomes, we collect them in the uh, rough ER, and then we transfer the, the proteins to the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus will receive a vesicle filled with proteins of all sort, and the Golgi will sort them out, and they'll send you know, a uh, certain like growth hormone protein, it'll send it over to this portion of the Golgi. And over here is an enzyme and over here is another enzyme. And, and so what goes into the Golgi is one big ball filled with all sorts of proteins. I mean, uh, you know, all sorts of proteins. And what comes out of the Golgi are individual vesicles with nothing but <clears throat> that specific type of protein together. The Golgi organizes the, the proteins as they get produced. It's sort of like the FedEx center <clears throat> of, of the cell or UPS or whoever. Because you know, if you've ever seen the sorting pictures of the sorting center in Memphis, where packages come in from all over the country and then they're sorted out so that a plane goes off to Chicago or to San Francisco or to, to uh, you know, New Orleans or someplace like that with all the packages for New Orleans. And so they sorted it, you know, in Memphis. And there's other sorting centers around the country too, but the original was in Memphis. Everything went into Memphis, then it went out from there. And that's what the Golgi does. It sorts proteins out based on what they are and where they're gonna go. It looks something like this. That's what it looks like for real on the right-hand side. But after we've got our vesicle coming from the endoplasmic reticulum filled with proteins, the Golgi is going to sort them out and release these um, vesicles that contain nothing but the, the uh, same protein. And so we're going straight from the rough ER to the vesicle. Now the vesicles have three choices. Um, we can release the proteins right into the, in, to the interstitial fluid around the cell. That's pathway A. Pathway B is to incorporate the proteins into the own cell membrane. And pathway C is to stick them off to the side in a lysosome, which is, contains digestive enzymes. So you got three, you know, these proteins as they get made, you got three choices. Okay. Peroxisomes, another type of organelle present here. Peroxisomes are designed to protect us. Peroxisomes go after what we call our free radicals. During metabolic activity, we are always uh, ending up with little uh, molecule fragments that we call a free radical that have um, the wrong charge on them, for example. Sodium ions for, are supposed to be positively charged. But what if you get a sodium with a negative charge? That's not what it's supposed to be. Or uh, a, an oxygen with a negative charge or a, uh, a chlorine with a positive charge. That alters the ability of the cell to undergo metabolic activity. It needs to be destroyed because it's, you know, this free radical will, run, will bounce through the cell and it will combine with healthy structures and destroy them. And so we have to detoxify uh, the free radical. We have to get rid of it. We don't like to have uh, uh, free radicals. Ever hear the term antioxidants? You know, okay, antioxidants work by getting rid of free radicals. You know, uh, antioxidants uh, uh, prevent the, the free radical from oxidizing. Uh, destroying other substances. So we talk about like the antioxidants that are in, in chocolate uh, or in red wine or stuff like that, or just different medications. Uh, so in our bodies, we use two detoxifiers. We use the enzyme oxidase. 
oxidates converts these free radicals to hydrogen peroxide, H, good old H2O2, the same type of stuff that you see in the little brown bottles. You go down to Walgreens and it, you, know, you pour it on a cut and it bubbles out and stuff like that. We've all seen hydrogen peroxide. Uh, hydrogen peroxide, unfortunately, is also a toxic chemical. It's a little stronger than the stuff that you pour on your on your skin when you have a cut. So we to get we've made we've made the hydrogen peroxide using oxidase. Now we use a second enzyme called catalase, which breaks the hydrogen peroxide down to water. And so we get rid of uh, these free radicals. We destroy them. We detoxify them. Uh, and the peroxisomes are functioning as an antioxidizer. So we use uh, oxidase and catalase to do that. Lysosomes, I've mentioned them already. Lysosomes are what are going to go dissolve the cell next door if the cell next door starts acting erratically. Because we don't like our cells. We like our cells to be doing what cells are supposed to be doing. If a cell steps out of line, it's because something's wrong with it. And so if a cell steps out of line, it's usually destroyed by its friends and neighbors if it doesn't destroy itself first. Lysosomes are a, like a sac, uh, a, a, a um, phospholipid bilayer con, uh, sac that contains digestive enzymes that won't eat the inside of the cell unless the, 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 uh, the membrane breaks down. But if we eat things like bacteria and viruses and toxic chemicals, then we can break them apart with these lysosomes. Um, we, when, when an organelle wears out, because organelles don't last for forever in the cell. If a mitochondria wears out, we'll get rid of it. We, we'll fuse with the uh, lysosome and we'll dissolve it. If, uh, you know, like I said, if we've eaten a bacteria that we want to get rid of, we'll use the lysosomes to get rid of it. Um, when we need glucose, we will use like lysosomes to break down glycogen. When we need calcium, because our bodies are always going to need calcium, when we need calcium, we're going to use lysosomes to break down the, uh, the bone to release calcium for us. Uh, and when the cell becomes damaged or the cell wears out, and can't reproduce, then the cell will uh, um, self-destruct. It'll undergo what we call autolysis. Uh, it will initiate what's known as apoptosis, where the cell will release its own digestive enzymes and break itself down. And then the, the fragments are then consumed by the other cells around them. So there is an interesting uh, condition that occurs with uh, lysosomes. See, our bodies use lysosomes to keep the uh, production of glycolipids in our brain. When, when we are infants, we produce lots of glycolipids. Those are those fats, you know, uh, a sugar-coated fat, if you will. We use these glycolipids to um, insulate and protect are developing nerves and neurons in our brain cells. And so we, we're always producing <clears throat> glycolipids in our brain and our central nervous system, and it's, it's fine. But what if we don't keep those in check? Because see, we use lysosomes to dissolve those, those excess lipids. We're, we're making lipids for a long time, uh, up through our teenage years, and then as long as we're making lysosomes, we keep them from getting out of, out of hand. But there is a genetic disorder where we don't have the enzyme necessary to destroy uh, these excess fats in, in our central nervous system. It's known as Tay-Sachs disease. It is a um, what we call an autosomal recessive disease. In other words, you have to have both for, uh, you have to inherit both recessive traits from the disease, 
from the mother and the father. It's not something that you catch, if you will. Um, and what will happen is uh, the child will be born normally. If the, if the child has both recessive traits, the child will be born normally, but then will start uh, having neurological issues around age two or three as their brain uh, is starting to be compressed by this buildup of these fatty uh, carbohydrates in their, you know, around their brain because the enzyme that would break them down isn't present. So, uh, so it says we see these prominent, predominantly in descendants or of Central, P Central European uh, Jewish individuals. It was a, um, it was one, it was a condition that occurred if you were, um, uh, had uh, from a Jewish family in Central Europe, uh, you, you have uh, Tay-Sachs disease in gene pool. And it, you know, even, even in, uh, up until, you know, even into 2022, uh, if you have, you know, this disease continues to show up. The, um, why do I talk about this now? Because we don't see a lot of uh, individuals from, from Central Europe in, in the South. Well, the reason I mention it is not because I like talking about Tay-Sachs disease, but because it wasn't just um, that particular uh, genetic group, you know, uh, Central European Jews. It also showed up <coughs> in a population in Canada. Uh, the early settlers of Canada came from France and they, they were the French Canadians and they carried the gene too for Tay-Sachs disease. And then somewhere in the um, 1700s, 1800s, somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, most of the French Canadian, a, a fair portion of the French Canadians that lived in Eastern Canada were kicked out of uh, those areas of Canada, I guess, because they were French and Canada was British at the time. And so they were kicked out. So they went, and we know where they went. Ever hear of a Cajun? They went to Louisiana. Yeah, they went down to, you know, in Louisiana, that was French territory uh, in the early 1800s before it was sold to the US. So they went there and they lived, and to this day, you have a fair amount of people of uh, what they would refer to as Cajun descent in that area, and they carry the gene. So now the odds of you encountering this condition in some healthcare are a lot more likely than you know if you were in New York City and dealing with you know people from Eastern European descent, or if you were uh, in Canada, the French Canadians didn't leave. Uh, you, there's there's a very strong possibility that you may likely encounter someone because it's not that far to New Orleans from here or Louisiana from here. And it's easy to think about you that you would encounter someone like that. So there's a reason I, I, I talked about this. It's not very common, but it does exist. And since it's genetic, there is no, uh, it, it's not something that can be cured. It, you know, you had the recessive uh, genes, uh, you're either a carrier or you're going to have the disease. Okay, now. And in an infant, the child that has it usually dies by the age of five. So it, it's a very, it's a very tragic condition. Okay, let's try and move on to something a little less depressing. Uh, well, I've been depressing all morning, haven't I? So, cytoskeleton. Believe it or not, all of our cells have a skeleton-like structure. It's what gives them their shape. It gives them something to pull on when they're contracting, like uh, muscle proteins. Uh, it holds, it allows them to be extremely long or short and round uh, or dimpled or whatever structure we have for our various cells. So we have a cytoskeleton made up of three different types of structures. We have what are known as the microfilaments, uh, the intermediate filaments, and the microtubules. 
So the um, microtubules, the microfilaments, and the intermediate filaments. So the um, microtubules, they're going to be uh, things like spindle fibers during mitosis, you know, pulling the um, uh, chromosomes uh, to opposite ends of a cell, pushing the cytoplasm apart. Those are going to be uh, these microtubules. Microfilaments are the contractile protein structures because when we have skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle works by one protein sliding over top <coughs> of the other. <coughs> and those um, proteins, we, <coughs> excuse me, we refer to as microfilaments. And then we have the intermediate filaments where we see cilia, we see flagella, uh, there are larger structures in here. So these are the three different types of, um, of structures in the, site, in the cytoskeleton. Something else we see in, in our cells <clears throat> is known as the centrosome. It's the center of the cell. And at the center of the cell, we're gonna have uh, a structure that looks like two barrels called centrioles. And the centrioles are where we form our spindle fibers from. It's where we form uh, our cilia and our flagella. They generally, we, we have, there, there's a pair of them. They look like little barrels. They, they're situated in right, at right angles to each other. And they're one of the first things to replicate during mitosis so we can have a set on each side of the, uh, of the cell so we can generate our spindle fibers. Cilia and flagella, I've already mentioned that. Cilia uh, are um, going to uh, allow cell, certain, allow non-mobile cells to move like uh, egg cells in the fallopian tube are gonna be pushed along by the cilia. We have mucus lining the inside of our airway that traps dust and dirt, and we bring that mucus up thanks to the cilia moving in one direction. Flagella on sperm cells power the sperm as it swims through the semen. We also see an extension called microvilli. The term villi means finger. Microvilli are folds in the surface membrane of the cell to increase its surface area. Areas where we're going to Structures where we absorb nutrients, like in our small intestine, they're lined with simple columnar cells. The membrane of the simple columnar cells extends upward into these villi, so we have an increased surface area. And then we, coming off the villi, we have microvilli, so we have an even greater surface area. The surface area, now our small intestine is 20 feet long, it's about the size of your finger. The total surface area of the small intestine is something about like twice the floor size of this classroom. So it's a huge amount of surface area for absorption because that's what it does. It absorbs nutrients. It absorbs everything in here. And it does so by having the, taking advantage of these folds, these villi and these microvilli. Okay, so now let's take a look at the largest organelle in our cells. This is the nucleus. Every cell has a nucleus except red blood cells. And red blood cells had a nucleus for a while, but before they get released from the bone marrow, they kick that nucleus out so they can ha have more room to carry hemoglobin, meaning they can carry more oxygen. Now, Every cell in our body that has a nucleus, most of them only have one, one nucleus. Skeletal muscle cells have multiple nucleus. Skeletal nuclei, multiple, multiple, many. They have a whole bunch of nuclei in there. They, um, doesn't matter because they don't reproduce. They don't have to worry about their DNA in there. But when we're laying down our muscle cells, when we're in utero, our muscle cells, our skeletal muscle cells, are made from lots of smaller cells. And when they came together, they kept their nucleus. So that's why, if you remember the slide 
um, on the lab test of all of the skeletal muscle cells and it had all those nuclei, they had about a half a dozen uh, uh, nuclei there lined up and it was multiple nuclei. That's what skeletal muscles have. So if anybody marked multiple nucleus, they got credit for that. If they marked nucleus, they got credit for that, by the way. So, so even, if it, even if it marked you wrong, uh, you got, I, I gave you credit for it. So a nucleus, the largest organelle, has three parts. It has a nuclear membrane or nuclear envelope. And it's the same structure, the phospholipid bilayer as the as the cell as the, the cell membrane, it has what's known as the nucleoli inside there, and it has what's known as chromatin. So the nuclear membrane, uh, it, it uh, phospholipid bilayer. Instead of cytoplasm, we have nucleoplasm. It is the goop inside the nucleus. Um, the Nuclear membrane is continuous with the rough ER. So there are openings, uh, there, are, there are pores, openings, holes in the, in the nucleus, the membrane of the nucleus that opens right into the rough endoplasmic reticulum. We want in, because the nucleus is going to send signals out to the ribosomes and it doesn't want to have any issues with it getting across its own membrane, so it goes right through a nuclear pore. The other structure you see inside here is going to be the nucleoli. That is where we're busy making RNA, particularly ribosomal RNA. This is where we make the ribosome structures that we're going to find in the rough ER. So there's our nucleus. There is the membrane or envelope. These are the pores, all these little yellow things here are the pores. And there is the nucleolus in the center of the nucleus right there. And you can see how the pores open up directly into the rough ER. There's what our surface looks like. All these little things are the pores. If you look at the pores up close, it looks sort of like flowers, but the middle of the flower is actually the opening. And then we see filaments that help give the uh, nucleus its structure. So this term chromatin, chromatin is a mixture of DNA and histone. Histone is protein. So we have the chromatin is 30% DNA, 60% histone and 10% RNA. Uh, it's made up of nucleosomes, which is nothing more than the DNA wrapped around the histones. It looks sort of like, uh, it's often been described as looking like a candy cane, the way that they wrap around each other. The, um, the chromatin, chromatin is the DNA, you know, the most important part of the chromatin is the DNA. The reason we use the histone is to protect the DNA strand. The DNA strand is really fragile. You know, it's a, it's a six foot long molecule and it's very, very thin and it's spiraled and it is very fragile. So we protect it by wrapping it with this protein called histone. The only time we call them chromosomes though is when the chromatin condenses. And that only occurs when the cell is about to go into mitosis and cell division. So normally our chromosomes, our, our, our DNA is in an unwound state uh, where we just, where we have the chromatin wrapped around the histones in here, and it's all stretched out. The only time we see it condensed is when we're ready to, uh, for the, the cells ready to undergo mitosis. And this is what uh, chromatin looks like. You know, it, the, uh, the DNA wraps itself around the histones and it, it produces an effect very similar to what a candy cane looks like. And it's only when we're ready to go undergo mitosis, is when, uh, it only condenses when we're ready to undergo mitosis. The reason it condenses 
is because it's easier to move the chromosome, the chromatin from one side of the cell to another without it getting snagged on something or break on something. Now the cells tend to operate you know, with their DNA and their RNA and everything, all the other things they do with their organelles. The cells tend to operate under a cycle. And the cycle it runs in a, in a same pattern over and over again. The underlying root, routine of the cell cycle is interphase. Cells are gonna be in interphase for about 99.9% .9 of the cell cycle. That's when the cell is busy being a cell. It's doing you know, cell stuff like absorbing nutrients or uh, you know, making uh, hormones or uh, you know, killing bacteria. Whatever it's doing, that's its life during interphase. But then it will go into mitosis. When it's time to reproduce, it will go into mitosis and cell division. And that is a very, very short period of time. It is measured, usually measured in seconds. You know, if, if a cell lives for 24 hours, the last five or 10 seconds of the 24 hours is how much time the cell is gonna spend in mitosis and uh, cytokinesis. So interphase has, you know, that's like I said, that's when the cell is being a cell. And within interphase, there are some subphases here that are going on. Uh, bear, keep in mind that all the DNA is in its chromatin state. It's all unwound. It's still controlling everything. It doesn't need to be condensed. Now, interphase has three parts to it, though. It has what's called the G1 stage, the GAP one stage. So lots of growth, lots of metabolic activity going on here. This one runs for quite a while. Uh, if a cell doesn't divide, if a cell doesn't reproduce, it's, say, it's in the G sub zero stage. Muscle cells, skeletal muscle cells don't divide. We have all the skeletal muscle cells we're ever gonna have, so they are stuck in G sub zero. Nerve cells are stuck in G sub zero. They don't divide either. So the, the nerve cells we had at birth are the nerve cells we have now. So they are permanently stuck in this G sub zero state. Now there's also, the, the next stage to consider is the S or synthetic stage. Since mitosis involves nuclear replication, we got to have a, a second complete set of DNA. You know, we have, we have our DNA in a nucleus, and if we're going to make a daughter cell, we have to have another brand new complete set of DNA to go with go to the daughter cells. So each daughter cell has to get two has to each has to get a set of DNA. So we have to copy the original DNA. And that's what happens in the, in the S or syn synthesis stage. We replicate our DNA. And then after that stage, we go into what's known as the gap two stage or G2, where we get ready for uh, mitosis and division. So this is our cell cycle. Interphase runs all the way around from start at G1 all the way around to G2, the end of G2. The actual amount of time spent in mitosis and cytokinesis is about one of those little black lines there. Not, it's not that little wedge. It's just the, the line. Because we're busy being a cell all the way around to right before we uh, undergo mitosis and, and cytokinesis. Now the S stage, the DNA synthesis stage, is where we make a perfect copy of our DNA. And it has to be perfect. Because if it isn't, first of all, if there's something wrong with our DNA, we'll never get into the S stage. And if we get into the S stage, we make a copy of the DNA that we have, and it, doesn't, it isn't a perfect copy, then we'll stop and do it again. And we'll keep doing it and fixing it until we get a perfect copy. And if we can't get a perfect copy, then the cell may destroy itself or just go to sleep and doesn't do anything after that. And then 
But if we produce a perfect copy of our DNA, or we have two perfect copies, then we go immediately into the G2 phase and we, get re we start producing the enzymes that we need and the proteins we need for cytokinesis and mitosis. And then we go right into mitosis. Now, in reality, the, 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 the synthesis stage and the G2 stage are very, very close to the end of the, end of the, the cycle. Because we can't go around with two sets of DNA. We, got, we can only use one set of DNA. So we gotta be very, very close to the end of the cycle. Uh, it isn't like uh, for half the time, we're gonna have a second set of DNA uh, in the nucleus. We couldn't work that way. So everything sh should really be compressed over into a couple of very tiny lines towards the end of the cycle. So, so how do we replicate our DNA? Well, we use something called semi-conservative replication. We take the original strand of DNA and we open it up. We use an enzyme called helicase. The helicase splits the double helix. We end up with Take, take the, the double strand and we end up and we form what we call a replication fork. And we start laying down, making a new strand on each side based off of the original. <coughs> so we take our original strand, split it open, and start building. You know, we, can, we build two new strands based off the original. We use the original strand there as the, as the template as the model. So the strand on the top and the strand on the bottom, then we just start bringing in the, the nucleotides with the appropriate bases and start making two new strands out of it. We call it, the, we call it a replication fork where they split and we form a bubble as we lay down new uh, bases. The whole thing is called semi-conservative replication because we're, we're going to use the original strand to make the two new strands. And that way we get identical daughter cells getting identical DNA. You know, we say semi-conservative replication, each new DNA, each new DNA strand is made of an old strand and a new one. And we will, we will produce one side and then we'll produce the other side and then we have two sets of DNA through semi this process called semi-conservative replication. Each daughter cell gets a set of uh, perfect DNA. And it is a very rapid process. We can make uh, 10 billion pairs of DNA in just a few hours. So if a cell has a lifetime of 24 hours, then the last few hours are spent in replicating the DNA and um, getting it ready to be separated into two daughter cells. Uh, some cells do only last 24 hours, some last a few, few days, some last for weeks, some last for months. But again, when the replication occurs, um, it, it's very, very quick. Okay, now, so semi-conservative, Replication. Let's go ahead and show you how this works. Copying DNA, a process called DNA replication, is very simple. The two complementary DNA strands separate, and because each nucleotide can only pair with its complement, A with T and C with G, each strand can be used as a template to build a new complementary strand, producing two DNA molecules. In the cell, DNA replication is a little more complicated, but the principle is the same. For clarity, we have untwisted the double helix. DNA replication begins at specific sites called origins of replication. Proteins attach here and separate the DNA strands, forming replication bubbles which grow in both directions. Enzymes called DNA polymerases move along the template DNA strands and catalyze the elongation of new strands. Eventually, all the replication bubbles merge, yielding two identical DNA molecules. 
And you notice there was another enzyme involved here. We used helicase to split open the strands, but what makes the strands come together to build the new strands, we use an enzyme called DNA polymerase. It's, you know, it, it makes the polymer, the new DNA. So we end up with two strands of DNA. Uh, each DNA molecule now has an old part and a new part. And we have uh, the original template and the new strand attached to it. Okay, and this is a good place to stop too. So anybody have any questions on any of this? Okay, then I'm gonna go ahead and stop. Uh, lab this afternoon is, is we're still doing, doing the, we're doing the appendicular skeleton. You've seen the bones uh, laying out around you. So if, if you have lab today, that's what you'll be playing with.